So yat e, yat e. Mark Charles in this year. Sin bekei dene in this year. To tohe glini bata chin. Sin bekei dene bata che. To tohe chitni bata nella. In the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always give your four clans. We're a matrilineal people, and so our identities come from our mother's mother. Now, my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so in my introduction, I say "sin bekei dene nishle," which translated means "I'm from the Wooden Shoe People." My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also "sin bekei dene." And my fourth clan, my father's father is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Before we go any further tonight, I want to just stop and acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Yokuts people. And I want to ask if there are any, if anyone here tonight is from this tribe, from the Yokuts people. Okay, I like to ask wherever I go, um, just because it's very important for us to acknowledge uh, the people whose land that we are standing on. It is vital that we remember these lands were not discovered, but they were colonized, um, they were conquered, they were stolen, and that there, are, there were people, societies, who farmed and, and stewarded these lands for hundreds, even thousands of years before white settlement moved in, before Columbus got lost at sea. And so I, I like to just recognize the, the people whose land that we're standing on. Now, I have to warn you, uh, in the next two hours, we are going to cover a lot of history. I will say many things that will offend you. Some of it may be so offensive that you will want to stand up and walk out. Others of it may actually prompt you to want to throw something at me. Resist both urges. Stay engaged, let's stay in the dialogue. We will get to a better place, but there's a lot of things that we don't understand that we have to understand before we really can begin to discuss what we need to discuss. So one of the things I wanna start with is just asking your, I wanna give you a statement and I want, to, I want you to, to think about a response. The United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A dialogue on par with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that took place in South Africa, Rwanda, and Canada. Do you agree or disagree? You don't have to say the, the answer. Do you agree or disagree? And how much do you agree or how much do you disagree? I want you to think of a number between one and 10. A one if you completely disagree with me and a 10 if you absolutely agree with me. The United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A dialogue that's on par with the, Nash, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that took place in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. Make a mental note of your number. One, you completely disagree with me. Ten, you absolutely agree with me. Make a mental note of that number because we're going to come back to this question towards the end of the presentation. As we advertise tonight, we're going to be talking about American history and race. And you cannot understand American history unless you first understand the history of the church. We talk about the fact that we have a separation of church and state here in America, but we really don't. There is a very deep intertwining, intermingling between the church and the state of the United States of America. And they have deeply impacted and influenced each other. And so to understand the history of the United States, we actually have to go back all the way to the teachings of Jesus. So when Jesus came into this earth, he was facing a challenge, which is he was coming to a people who had a land covenant with the God of Israel. Their land covenant was a barometer of their relationship with God. When they were obedient to this God, he blessed them and they were on their land. When they were disobedient to this God, he exiled them and removed them from their land. And when Jesus came, the people of Israel, they were on most of their land, but they were not fully self-governing. They were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And so they knew in the barometer that they were out of sorts with their relationship with God. And so they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for someone to come and return them back into the good graces with God. They were looking for someone to throw off their imperial oppressors and looking for someone to establish them back in the greatness of the kingdom of David. 
Now, Jesus knew he was coming into this sort of expectation. He knew this is what he was going into. And so he tried his best to kind of address these challenges. He was the son of God. He was announced by angels, but he was born in a barn and he was raised as a refugee. There was this expectation of all the people that he was, that the Messiah, whoever he would be, would be this imperial Messiah. And so Satan, in his one of the first interactions with Jesus, he takes him up to the top of a tall building and he shows him the kingdoms of the world and says, if you bow down to me, I will give all these kingdoms to you. Jesus walks away. No, that's not the goal. I'm not here to make an imperial kingdom here on earth. One day he's out with his disciples. And there's with, there are about 4,000 men, probably 8,000 people with them. And they're kind of hungry. So Jesus sends his disciples out. They find this kid. They shake him down. They take his lunch. And Jesus feeds everybody with it. The people are so excited, they come to him to make him king by force. But he walks away. I'm not here to set up an earthly kingdom. When he's with James and John and they've gone into the Samaritan villages and the Samaritans have rejected Jesus and Jesus is walking out and James and John say to him, Master, shall we call down from heaven to destroy them? Now this sounds outlandish to us, but to them it made perfect sense. Back then, if you disobeyed God, he sent a prophet to you. If you received the prophet and repented, God had mercy on you. If you rejected the prophet, fire and brimstone rained down from heaven. And who doesn't want to be the one to call down fire from heaven? The Samaritans were probably the reason they were under the oppression of the Romans. They were worshiping God outside the temple. They were intermarrying with other people. They were probably the reason they were being oppressed. And James and John probably felt pretty good about themselves that they went to the Samaritans in the first place. They were probably excited that the Samaritans rejected God, our Jesus. And so they said, I want to be the one to call down fire from heaven and destroy them. And Jesus rebukes them. No, that's not what we're doing. Later, when he's before Pilate, Pilate's trying to get him to answer some questions. And he says, don't you know, I'm the one who can kill you or set you free. Jesus, you have no authority over me. The only authority you have is what my Father in heaven gave to you. My kingdom's not of this earth. If my kingdom were here, my servants, the angels, would come and set me free. My kingdom's somewhere else. Jesus was very, very, very adamant. His kingdom was not here on earth. He did not come here to establish a earthly Christian kingdom. And so in the first two third centuries, the church, when you join the church through your baptism, your confession, your discipleship, and your community, you knew that you were following a church, you were joining a body that stood in opposition to the empire. You knew that there was a good chance, like Jesus and his disciples, that the longer you were in this church, the greater chance you had of being persecuted and possibly even killed by the empire. Now, in the, in the third century, the fourth century, Constantine becomes emperor of Rome. And while he's emperor, he decides to become a Christian. And after he becomes a Christian, he decides to Christianize Rome, to create Christendom. This Christian imperial entity. Now, the creation of Christendom fundamentally changes what it means to be the church. Now, instead of joining the church through your baptism, your confession, your discipleship, and your community, now you become a member of the church because of your citizenship in the empire. Now, this changes the church fundamentally because the, the empire keeps doing what empires do, which is they protect themselves, they defend themselves through the act of warfare. A plain text reading of Jesus' teachings doesn't allow Christian citizens to do this. And so the theologians of the day are confronted with a challenge. Do they try to speak prophetically to this new Christendom and this young baby Christian named Constantine? Or do they collude with empire and try to find to make it work? Now, one of the major theologians of that day was Augustine. And in the next century, Augustine begins writing what's called the just war theory. Now, the just war theory is really twofold. A, now that the empire is quote-unquote Christian, they're trying to find a way to fight wars more justly. Second, they're trying to find a way to justify how Christian citizens of this Christian empire can go off and kill in the name of God. So I use the fact that we have a just war theory as evidence that the 
theologians, the church, instead of speaking prophetically to Christendom, they decided to collude with it, to try and find to make it work. But I was always wondering, where would Jesus kind of rebuke the theologians, right? Whenever someone tried to, tried to combine his teachings with empire, Jesus reacted pretty strongly. What did he say to Peter when Peter said, you don't have to die? He called him Satan, right? Get behind me, Satan. You are not on the side of God, but of men. So Jesus reacts very strongly when people try to collude his teachings with empire. And so I was wondering where in Augustine's teachings would Jesus, if he's not afraid to call St. Peter Satan, he's certainly going to be afraid to call St. Augustine Satan, where would he rebuke St. Augustine? I looked through the readings on just war, I looked through the readings on the two kingdoms, and Augustine, while he's very clear the kingdom of God is not, or the kingdom of man is not the kingdom of God, but he seems to take this mentality that says, but it's better than being persecuted, so let's try and find a way to make this thing work. Now, in his book, towards the end of his life, Augustine writes a book called On the Correction of the Donatists. The Donatists are a heretical group. They're teaching heresy. They're leading people astray. They've been a thorn in Augustine's side for most of his life and ministry. And in this book, rebuking and looking at the heresy of, of the Donatists, Augustine begins asking the question, what is the role of the Christian king in a Christian empire? This is a new phenomenon. They've never had this before. And Augustine writes that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to prevent and chastise with religious severity all those acts which are done in opposition to the commands of the Lord. He says that the Christian king in the Christian empire serves the Lord by enforcing with suitable rigor such laws as ordain what is righteous and punishes what is the reverse. So he's saying the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to enforce the commands of God, i.e. the doctrines of the church, with the resources of the state. In chapter 6, he goes on, and he says, it's better that men should worship God through sound teaching than be driven through it, to it through punishment, fear, and pain. But many of us have found advantage, he said, in first being compelled through fear and pain so that they might later be open to sound teaching. So now Augustine is arguing that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to use the resources of the state through fear, punishment, and pain to force people to worship God. He is clearly off the rails here. I'm sure if Jesus had no problem calling St. Peter Satan, he would have no problem calling out Augustine and saying, get behind me, Satan. You are not on the side of God, but of men. Now this, of course, over the next few centuries, morphs into what we call the Crusades. The Crusades are about expanding the Christian empire as well as protecting Jerusalem. And then in the, in the 14th, 13th and 14th century, or the 12th and 13th century, we have, um, we have uh, Thomas Aquinas who begins to write, and he's also trying to deal with the heretics. And Thomas Aquinas is, is saying that if the, if the kingdoms of this world, the secular kingdoms, have the authority to kill people because they break men's laws, how much more authority does the church have to kill people who break God's laws? And he writes that it is a much graver matter to corrupt the faith which quickens the soul than to forge money which supports temporal life. Wherefore, if forgers of money and other evildoers are forthwith condemned to death by the secular authority, how much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they are convicted of heresy, to not only be excommunicated, but even put to death? So Aquinas is arguing that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to now kill people who don't follow the commands of the church. Clearly, this is outside the bounds. In the 13th century, the church develops a new term that they call the infidel. The infidel is a subhuman term. It's first applied to the Moors, the Muslims. Later, it's applied to indigenous people, anyone who doesn't worship the god of the white European Christian. Now that we have this subhuman category of infidel, now this even changes the need for just war. Now you don't need a just war theory. Now you can go to war based on your theological grounds because you're fighting the other. You're fighting the enemies of Christ. And so it's out of this that in 1452, Pope Nicholas V writes out the words, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Convert them to his and to their use and profit. 
This papal bull, along with other papal bulls between 1452 and 1493, collectively become known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever land you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are less than human and the land is yours for the taking. This is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the people, or colonize the nation and enslave the African people. They didn't believe them to be human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. If you think about it, you cannot discover lands already inhabited, right? If you don't believe me, leave your car keys, your cell phones, your laptops out. I'll come by and discover them for you. Clearly, this isn't discovery, right? This is conquering. This is stealing. The fact that to this day, we refer to what Columbus did as discovery of America. We have monuments and history books and speeches in honor of Columbus as the discoverer of America. This reveals the implicit bias of the nation, which is that whites are superior and natives are subhuman. This, of course, makes the doctrine of discovery a systemically white supremacist doctrine that is the direct fruit of a church that has prostituted itself out to the empire. Now, the challenge is this doctrine has been embedded in the foundations of the country. So in 1763, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains, and he says to the colonists who are here that they no longer have the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upsets the colonists. They want access to those lands. So a few years later, they write a letter of protest. In their letter, they accuse the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. They go on in their letter to state that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. Literally 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal. The Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Making it very clear the only reason our founding fathers used this inclusive term, all men, because they had a very narrow definition of who was actually human. Now, this, of course, makes the Declaration of Independence a systemically white supremacist document that assumes the dehumanization of indigenous peoples and people of color. Now, a few years later, our founding fathers wrote another document. They started this one with the words, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. This, of course, is the preamble to the Constitution. However, if you read this Constitution, just a few lines later, Article 1, Section 2, the section of the Constitution that determines who is and who is not covered by this document, who is and who is not a part of this union, if you read Article 1, Section 2, the first thing you will note is it never mentions women. Now, this is important because if you read the entire Constitution from preamble through the last amendment, you will note that there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns who can run for office, who can hold office, even who is protected by this document. 51 gender-specific male pronouns, not a single female pronoun is used. So first we have to note that women are never mentioned. Second, natives are explicitly excluded, and Africans are counted as three-fifths. So who's left? Well, in 1776, this leaves white land-owning men. That's who could vote. We have to realize the purpose of the Constitution is to protect white land-owning men. This is why it was written. White land-owning men of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to white land-owning men and white land-owning men's posterity. So today we act surprised that our prisons are filled with people of color. Shouldn't surprise us. The Constitution is working. We act surprised that in 2010, Congress sides with Citizens United and rules that natives are that, that corporations now have the same rights to political free speech as individuals. This opens the door for super PACs, unlimited contributions to candidates. 
This shouldn't shock us. The Constitution is doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's protecting the interests of white landowning men. Maybe you're thinking, wait, we, we corrected that, right? Well, we tried, but 100 years later, we passed an amendment. We passed the 13th Amendment. Who knows what the 13th, 13th Amendment does? Who can tell me? What does it do? So it, this allows slavery unless someone is brought in under the criminal justice system. Okay. Yeah, so most people think that the, the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery. They think this is what it says. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. But what it actually says is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, wherefore the party has been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. So have we ever abolished slavery? No. Where is it legal? Prison, right? So let's look at our incarceration rates. Well, it shouldn't surprise you, the United States of America incarcerates its citizens at the highest rate of any country in the world. For every 100,000 citizens, we incarcerate 683 of them. It's 110 higher than the next nation, which is Kirkmenistan, and about five, three to five times higher than most other nations. This is comparing us to NATO nations. And when we break these numbers out by race, it gets even worse. We incarcerate Hispanics at a rate of 831 per 100,000. Natives at a rate of 895 per 100,000, and African Americans are incarcerated at a rate of, of 2,306 per 100,000. White people, of course, are incarcerated at a much more humane rate of 450, but it's still very high. So we, just, we have to be clear, we've never abolished slavery. And to this day, we use it as a threat to remove the rights of citizenship from our citizens, particularly from our citizens of color. Now, a few years after that, we passed another amendment. This amendment was the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was a direct response to Article 1, Section 2. The 14th Amendment extends the right of citizenship to anyone born on this continent under the jurisdiction of the government. However, Section 2 of this amendment still specifically excludes natives, specifically excludes women, and it still makes the rights of citizenship based on not being brought under the criminal justice system. So while this amendment extended some rights of citizenship to a few former male slaves, temporarily, it still left disenfranchised and marginalized huge sections of the population. And we can't forget that after this amendment, we still had Jim Crow laws, we still had segregation, we still had Indian boarding schools, we still had Indian massacres, we still had internment camps, we still had mass incarceration. And in 1970, this was the very same amendment used in Roe versus Wade, which now determines unborn babies weren't human and therefore they could be aborted. What this demonstrates is that the heart of our constitution, there is no value for life. The value is actually for exploitation and profit and the assumption is one of dehumanization. This makes the Constitution of the United States a systemically white supremacist document that assumes the white landowning male has the authority to decide who is and who is not human. Now in 1823, we had a Supreme Court case. This was Johnson versus McIntosh. It's two men of European descent. They're litigating over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from a native tribe. The other one got the same land from the government. They want to know who owned it. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The court had to decide the principle that land titles were based on. They determined that the principle was that discovery gave title to the land, to the government by whose subject or by whose authority was made against all other European governments. And that title was consummated by possession. They then go on to reference the doctrine of discovery as a legal instrument and use that to determine that natives who are here first, but are not fully human, we only have what's called aboriginal title, the right of occupancy to the land, like a fish occupies water, a bird occupies air. And Europeans have the right of discovery to the land, the fee title to the land, and therefore they are the true title holders. This precedent well, this case, along with a few others in the 1820s and 30s, create the legal precedent for land titles. 
So today, if the Yakuts people were to come back and say, we want our land back and sue the city of Fresno in court, the city of Fresno wouldn't say we have a treaty with you because that treaty has been broken. They wouldn't say we conquered you because then the city of Fresno and the U.S. would lose their moral authority. They would go back to this 1823 Supreme Court case and say, no, look at, we have the right of discovery to this land and you only have the right of occupancy. You are what the, the U.S. government calls a domestic dependent. And you can be removed from this land and therefore they will lose this case in court. How do I know this? Because something like this happened in 1954. Hold on. In 1985 and most recently in 2005 where the United States Supreme Court in land titles, land cases with native peoples, specifically referenced the doctrine of discovery and this legal precedent. This of course makes the United States Supreme Court a white supremacist court that to this day has and uses legal precedent based on the assumption of white supremacy and the dehumanization of indigenous peoples. Now, initially, the Protestant church pushed back against this doctrine. This was a Catholic doctrine they didn't buy into it. In 1630, John Winthrop, a Protestant pastor, was in what's now called the Boston Harbor, and he was with a group of colonists to plant the Boston colony. He was on board a ship, and on this ship, he preached a sermon called a model of Christian charity. In this sermon, he referred to the colonists that he was with as a city upon a hill. Now he's borrowing from the language of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, be a lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, shining your good deeds into this dark world. He goes on his sermon to exhort them in all meekness, gentleness, patience, liberality. They should rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. They should keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. These are just your basic church going Christian exhortations. At the end of the sermon, he's exhorting the people to listen to what he's told them. And he begins quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 30 is the passage in the Old Testament where the people of Israel are standing at the banks of the Jordan River, ready to cross over and take possession of their promised lands. And God's reiterating the threats and promises of his land covenant with them. This is what will happen if you obey my, my commands. This is what will happen if you disobey my commands. So at the end of this passage, it says, but if our hearts shall turn away and we do not obey and worship other gods, we shall surely perish out of the good land, whether we pass over this river to possess it. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river, but in his sermon, John Winthrop changes river to vast sea. Why would he do this? Well, they didn't cross the river, they crossed an ocean. So what's he implying? Based on the exhortations of Jesus to be a city on a hill, based on the model of Old Testament Israel, they are standing on the banks of their promised land, ready to go and take possession of them. Now, who here has read the book of Joshua? What is God's command to the people of Israel and Joshua? How are they to take possession of their promised land? What are they to do to the Canaanites? Kill everybody. Leave no man, no woman, no child, no animal left alive. Promised land for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. I call this sermon the birth of American exceptionalism. This idea percolates for about a hundred years. Mid 1700s, we begin expanding westward. We go past the Appalachian Mountains. We go past the Mississippi River. End of the 1700s, we have the Second Great Awakening. There's a growth in churches. There's a renewal of denominations. Early 1800s, the phrase manifest destiny is coined. The belief that this nation of undocumented European immigrants has the God-given right to rule this continent from sea to shining sea. And maybe you're thinking, well, that's a bit of a stretch, Mr. Charles. I want you to think back three years ago. Benjamin Netanyahu was here in the U.S. and he was lobbying against the Iran nuclear deal that the Obama administration was negotiating. And he was invited against protocol by Speaker Ryan to address a joint session of Congress. Now, he was talking to a very divided, a very partisan Congress, and he had to get everyone, Democrats and Republicans, on the same page behind him. 
Now, there is a very unifying theme, a bipartisan theme that both parties accept and celebrate around that will always draw our Congress together. And that is the theme of American exceptionalism, which is rooted in the lie of white supremacy. And so early in his speech, he said to our Congress, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands. To bipartisan applause. So now that we have a white supremacist doctrine of discovery, a white supremacist declaration of independence, a white supremacist constitution, a white supremacist Supreme Court, and a God-given right to commit genocide, now we have a bit of history we have to talk about. So this is the history of our nation from 1775 to 2016. Every year in blue is years that the United States of America was fighting against another nation or entity. Every year in red is every year they were fighting against native tribes. This list of wars are the wars they fought against native peoples primarily during the 19th century. This is the century we teach as our century of expansion. This is the century we added 30 new states to the union. Well, clearly this one was not a century of expansion. This was a century of ethnic cleansing and genocide. It was during this century that the United States passed the Indian Removal Act. This was the act of Congress that allowed the United States military to, in practice by force, remove tribes from their land in the east to empty lands further in the west. This resulted in the Trail of Tears for the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, the Long Walk for the Navajo. All told, a dozen tribes experienced forced relocation. Tens of thousands of people died as a direct result of this act. In 1862, we had the largest mass execution in the history of our nation with the hanging of the Dakota 38, ordered by President Abraham Lincoln. In 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre. We had about 150 to 200 Cheyenne and Arapaho men, women, and children. They're encamped over a hillside in Colorado. They're waving a white flag of surrender and an American flag to show that they're peacefully. Colonel Shivington, a Methodist pastor, comes over with his army, and they, he orders all of them slaughtered. It's later reported that the soldiers parade the genitalia of the natives down the streets of Denver. In 1879, we have the start of the Indian boarding schools. This is the, the, the policy that allowed churches and the government to forcibly take natives from their home and raise them in military style boarding schools. Our children were punished for speaking their languages. They were punished for practicing their culture. The stories of abuse physical, mental, emotional, sexual, that happened in these stories, in these boarding schools is gut-wrenching. And the last of these schools didn't close until the 1970s and 80s. I actually attended a school that was transitioning from a boarding school to a day school. I was there as a day school student. I had friends there as a boarding school student. My experience and their experience were vastly different. In 1890, we had the massacre at Undini. We teach a bit more about this massacre. Something we don't teach about this. So the, the story of this massacre is that the Dakota people and the U.S. Army were in negotiations. The U.S. Army was trying to negotiate the surrender of one of the Dakota chiefs. And so they met at Wounded Knee to, to negotiate this surrender. Neither tried, side trusted each other. Tensions were high. There was a lot of weapons there. And no one knows exactly what happened, if a native or a, a U.S. Army fired first. But a, a shot was fired and chaos ensued. Now, the army, the U.S. Army, had up to what are called four Hotchkiss cannons. These are 37 millimeter cannons. They shoot 70 rounds per minute. They're accurate up to 2,000 yards. They had up to four of them there. And they begin raining bullets down on the natives who are below. There's a ravine right near Wounded Knee, and most of the natives ran into this ravine, most of the Dakota people. Now, what we don't teach is that the U.S. Army awarded 18 Congressional Medals of Honor to soldiers who participated in Wounded Knee. Three of those medals were awarded to soldiers specifically for flushing the natives out of the ravine. This is what our nation looks like This is what our nation looked like in 1840. 
The dark states to the east are the actual states. The lighter lands to the west are territories, are uncharted lands, unsettled lands. If you go on the US Army military website and you can look up medals of honor by war and by conflict. And if you look up medals of honor by Indian war campaigns, you will notice that there are 425 congressional medals of honor for US soldiers between 1839 and 1898 for fighting in the Indian wars. The end of the century, this is what the nation looked like. During this century, the dominant population ballooned from 5 million to 76 million. And the native population, that in the 1500s was at 4 million. In the 1800s, it was at 600,000. And by the 1900s, it was at 297,000. I want to talk about that ratio there. So if we take 1500 as a baseline and look at population growth around the world, in the 1500s, we had about 480 million people in the world. And in 1900, we had 1 1.6 billion. It's a 3.39 growth rate. In Europe, we went from 82 million to 300 million. That's a 3.65 growth rate. The US, which started at zero non-native people, by 1800, have 5.3 5 have million. And by 1900, had 76.2 million. Just in the past century, that's a 14.3% growth rate. Africa started at 63 million. And even with the slave trade, they had a lower growth rate, but they went from 60 million to 1.23 million, which is a 1.782 growth rate. Natives started at 400 or 4 million, approximately here in continental United States. And at 1900, we were down to 237,000. Now anything below zero is a negative, below one is a negative growth rate. We were at a 0 0.059. And if you go to our lowest point, which was in 1870, where they estimated there were 25,000, that's a 0 0.0064 growth rate. I chose 1500 because that's just after Columbus got lost. Now, between 1839 and 1898, there's just no other way to say it. Our nation awarded 425 Congressional Medals of Honor for the ethnic cleansing and genocide of Native peoples. On December 19, 2009, Congress passes House Resolution 3326. It's the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. It's a 67 page bill laying out the appropriations for the DOD for 2010. Page 45, subsection 8113, is titled Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What follows is this seven bullet point apology. It mentions no specific tribe, no specific treaty, no specific injustice. It says you had some nice land. Our citizens didn't take it very politely. Let's now just call it all of our land and steward it together. It then ends with a disclaimer saying nothing in here is legally binding. To date, this apology has not been announced, read, or publicized by the White House or by Congress. The problem is, is we don't teach a history of America, we teach a mythology. The mythology is that we have a legacy of discovery, we believe in equality, we have a history of expansion, we're exceptional, liberty and justice here exist for everyone, and we're a Christian nation. But this mythology is actually very, very deep. Who here has been to the Lincoln Memorial? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Who here has been to the museum at the base of the memorial? Okay. At the base of the Lincoln Memorial, there's a small museum about half the size of this gym. And on each wall, there are plaques with different writings and quotes by Abraham Lincoln about different parts of his legacy. And on one wall, there's a series of, a series of five or six plaques. They're a little bit smaller than, these, than these, uh, these things back here. They're about four or five feet tall, about two or three feet wide. And in the center of that wall, on one of the plaques, is his writings about the Union. And on that plaque, it says, I would save the Union. My paramount object in the struggle, writes Abraham Lincoln, is not to save or destroy slavery, it's to preserve the Union. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. 
If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Now, the Lincoln Memorial is one of the safe places in Washington, D.C. for people of color. Marches and speeches and protests have gone on in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And in the memorial, at the base, etched in stone, is a quote by Abraham Lincoln that literally says, according to him, black lives don't matter. I don't know what's more offensive, the fact that he said it or someone felt it was fit to hang here. The problem is, is we don't teach a history of America, we teach a mythology. The mythology says discovery, the history says dehumanization. The mythology says equality, the history says for a select few. The mythology says expansion, the history says ethnic cleansing. The mythology says exceptionalism, the history says genocide. The mythology says liberty and justice for all, the history says liberty and justice for white landowning men. The mythology says Christian nation, the history says Christendom. Now again, maybe you're thinking that's strong. I want you to think back to last summer. June of last summer, there was a terrorist attack in London. A car drove into some people, a guy got out and knifed some people. And on the day of that attack, Congressman Clay Higgins, who's from the third district of Louisiana, he's a US congressman, on his public Facebook page, this is what he wrote. The free world, all of Christendom, is at war with Islamic horror. Not one penny of American treasure should be granted to any nation who harbors these heathen animals. Not a single radicalized Islamic suspect should be granted any measure of quarter. Their intended entry to the American homeland should be summarily denied. Every conceivable measure should be engaged to hunt them down, hunt them, identify them, and kill them, kill them all. For the sake of all that is good and righteous, kill them all. U.S. Congressman Clay Higgins, 3rd District of Louisiana, June 4, 2017. I want to pause here for just a moment. And I want to just take a moment to exhale. I don't need a long answer. I don't need a story. I want two or three words, and there's no right and there's no wrong answer. Tell me how you feel. How does this history make you feel? There's no right or wrong answer. There's no good or bad answer. I just want to hear your emotions. Ashamed. Frustrated. Guilt, deceived, sick, sick. Heartbroken. heartbroken. Anyone else? Angry. Angry. Yeah. It's important to acknowledge these feelings. There's not much of this history we can go back and change, but there's a reason you've never heard this history before because it's difficult to talk about. It's difficult to, to, to verbalize. It's difficult to acknowledge. And so it's important that when we hear it, we acknowledge how it makes us feel because this, the way that we feel is the reason we never talk about it. Now, and this may not hearten you much, May, this may dishearten you more, but now we have to get into some really hard stuff. <laughs> so one of the challenges with America is that we've never lost a war that mattered. We've never lost a war that really threatened our national security on our homeland. And who writes the history books? The winners, right? I want to demonstrate this to you. Who can tell me the deadliest 24-hour his, his day, 24-hour period in human history that was caused by man? Not an earthquake, not a tsunami, not a fire. 
the deadliest 24 hour in human history that was man caused. Human caused. Hiroshima. Hiroshima, okay? Just one guess. Any other guesses? Uh, maybe one of the Allied fire bombings. Okay. Yeah, the actual answer is Operation Meeting House. Operation Meeting House was an incendiary dropping of bombs. Over 2,000 pounds of incendiary bombs were dropped on Tokyo overnight, just a few months before Hiroshima. U.S. estimates that we killed 100,000 people that night. Japanese estimates are higher, probably closer to 200,000. No one really knows. Because the bombing was so complete, the destruction was so di disastrous, you can't even count the number of people who died. We chose Japan for this bombing because of all their wooden structures they had and we knew they would burn hotter. Who can tell me how many civilians were killed at Pearl Harbor? Any guesses? Civilians. None? Very few. Any other guesses? 30? The actual number is 70, but most of those were from friendly fire. Our anti-aircraft guns firing at planes and going into Honolulu. The Japanese actually intentionally avoided civilian targets. In the nine months up to the ending of the World War II, when we were carpet bombing Japan and dropping our nuclear weapons, we chose civilian targets. They killed Less than 70 died at Pearl Harbor, most of them by our own fire. In the nine months leading up to the end of World War II, we killed between 300,000 and 600,000 Japanese civilians with our bombing of Japan. We don't talk about this much. Why? Who writes the history books? The victors, right? So I want you to imagine with me for a moment, okay? Imagine with me. Had Germany won World War II, okay? Had Germany won World War II, how would their history books treat Hitler? He's a genius. What else? Hero. What else? Had Germany won the war, how would their books treat Hitler? The Messiah. Okay? How would they teach the Holocaust? didn't happen. What Holocaust, right? Okay. So who is our greatest president? Any guesses? Who is our greatest president? Huh? Okay. Any other guesses? Actually, by national consensus, it usually wavers between George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And over the last couple decades, as race relations have gotten worse, the numbers have consistently shown Abraham Lincoln is selected by most Americans as our greatest president. Okay? Now, why is he our greatest president? Well, he's the great emancipator. He's a great unifier, he won the Civil War, and he abolished slavery. This is what we say, correct? Now remember, who writes the history books? The victors. So let's browse through Abraham Lincoln's life, okay? In 1858, Abraham Lincoln was in a very heated Senate debate, Senate battle campaign, against Judge Stephen Douglas. They were running for the Illinois Senate, Abraham Lincoln actually lost this. I don't know if he knew that. He lost that race. But he and Judge Douglas were debating back and forth. And back in their debates, they were not the back and forth we have today. But they were a series of speeches. The first candidate gave a speech for like 30 minutes or so. The second candidate responded with a 30 to 40 minute speech. And then the first candidate had another 20 to 25 minute speech that they responded with. So it was a series of three speeches. Now, George Washington was running against Judge Stephen Douglas, but he was also running this, against this perception that he was on the side of the, Af of the African people, of the slaves. 
And so in his first debate, in his first speech, entering into this debate, introducing himself, Abraham Lincoln said, I will say here while upon this subject that I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. There is a physical difference between the two, which in my judgment will probably forever forbid their living together upon the footing of perfect equality. And inasmuch as it becomes a necessity that there be a difference, I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of having the race to which I belong, having the superior position. In the fourth debate, he reiterated himself almost verbatim and said, I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. To applause. That I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold, hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together in terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. In his inaugural address, he felt the need to repeat himself again. And he wrote that apprehension seems to exist among the people of the southern states that by the ascension of a Republican administration, their property, i.e. the slaves, and their peace and personal security are to be endangered. I declare that I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Now, the morning of his inauguration in 1861, Congress was in a tizzy. Several southern states were threatening to secede from the Union, and they were on the brink of civil war, and they were trying to prevent this from happening. And so at 540 that morning, the U.S. Senate passed what is called the Corwin Amendment. The Corwin Amendment constitutionally protected slavery in the states where it already existed. No amendment shall be made to the Constitution that will authorize or give Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any, within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to service or to labor or service by the laws of said state. Now, even though the president has no role in amending the Constitution, James Buchanan, the outgoing Democratic president, signed this amendment to show he supported it. In his inaugural address a few hours later, Abraham Lincoln responded and said, I understand a proposed amendment to the Constitution, which amendment, however, I have not seen, has passed Congress to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the domestic institutions, so the states, including that of persons held to service. To avoid misconstruction of what I have said, I depart from my purpose not to speak of particular amendments, so far as to say that holding such a provision by now, to now by implied constitutional law, I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. So he is not opposed to a constitutional amendment protecting slavery in the states where it exists, making it express and irrevocable. Now, this amendment never got ratified, but Abraham Lincoln, even though presidents have no role in passing amendments, took the job of the archivist, who is the person who normally sends these amendments out to the states for ratification, and Abraham Lincoln himself personally sent these out to the states for their ratification. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed what's called the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act opened up land in the, south, in the west to people who wanted to homestead it. 60 acres was given to any family or American citizen who went out and lived on this land for five years. In July of 1862, he passed the Pacific Railway Act. The Pacific Railway Act opened up land and resources for the completion of the Transcontinental Railway and the Transcontinental Telegraph Line. So far, it had made it up to Omaha, Nebraska, and he provided the resources and the land for it to make it all the way to the West Coast. In, 18, in the fall of 1862, Horace Greeley, who was a editor of the New York Tribune, wrote a scathing op-ed calling for the immediate emancipation of the slaves. Abraham Lincoln already had the Emancipation Proclamation written. It was in his desk. But there were four states in the North 
that had not ceded from the Union, and they allowed slavery. Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And he was politically concerned of the fallout of the slave owners in those states. And so he wanted to address his concerns with him. And so he did not, he did not release the Emancipation Proclamation. Instead, he assured them why he was doing what he was doing. And he said, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. It's not to interfere. It's not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. This is, of course, the quote saying that black lives don't matter. That's hanging at the Lincoln Memorial. Now, in the fall of 1862, the Dakota people reluctantly were at a state of war with the American government and with the settlers. They had signed a treaty with the American government about a year and a half earlier in exchange for some of their lands. They would be given provisions, making it through the winters of Minnesota. Now, they had just come through a very harsh winter, and the government had not began meeting their treaty obligations, even though they gave up their land. So as they were coming into the fall, preparing for another winter, they were very concerned that they were not going to make it through another winter. And so they reluctantly decided to go to war against the settlers and against um, the people of that land. And so it started a 37-day war. It was a fairly bloody war. And at the end of the 37 days, half of the Dakota people fled north of Canada. The other half surrendered and turned themselves in. They were immediately put into military tribunals, and now they're being judged by the same people they're just fighting against. And their trials lasted just a few minutes, and over the period of a few weeks, over four or 500 of them were tried, and over 300 of them were condemned to death. Because these were military tribunals, their orders had to, their executions had to be ordered by the president, and so the orders went to, or the, 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 the convictions went to Abraham Lincoln, but 303 executions seemed too genocidal for Lincoln. But even though these trials were clearly a legal sham, he didn't order retrials. What he did is he changed the criteria of what warranted a death sentence. Under his new criteria, only two of the, of the Dakota people were going to die. Well, now he was afraid his white settlers were going to rise up. So again, instead of ordering retrials, he for a second time changed the criteria of what warranted a death sentence. Now he ran, landed on the magic number of 39. So the day after Christmas, 1862, 4,000 white settlers came out. They sang, hymns of, they sang hymns of praise while the largest mass execution in the history of the United States took place with the hanging of the Dakota 38. In January of 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation was very specific as to where it freed the slaves. It freed them in Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. It did not free the slaves in Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. Those states were left for the present precisely as if this proclamation were never issued. And those slaves didn't receive their freedom until after Abraham Lincoln died. In February of 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed a bill nullifying all the treaties with the people in the, the native peoples in the state of Minnesota. In March of 63, he signed another bill giving him the authority to forcibly remove all of those people, the native peoples from the state of Minnesota. And that removal began in the month of April the people were rounded up, they were loaded onto trains, loaded onto barges, and shipped out of Minnesota into the Dakota Territory to the Crow Creek Reservation. That removal was finished by September. In the fall of 1863, one of his generals, General Carleton, gave an order to Kit Carson in the territory of New Mexico, where the U.S. government was fighting the Apache and the Navajo people. This is my tribe. And the order that he gave was that henceforth, every Navajo male is to be killed or taken prisoner on sight. Say to them, go to the Busque Redondo, or we will pursue and destroy you. We will not make peace with you on any other terms. This war shall be pursued until you cease to exist or move. There can be no other talk on the subject. Kit Carson went through the New Mexico, the, the Navajo territory. He destroyed our homes. He 
killed our animals, he burned our crops, and he chased our people throughout the land, never letting us stop, never letting us recover, never letting us slow down. One of the historians writes that by the middle of December, most of the weak and aged had died. There's hardly a Navajo family that cannot remember tales of an aged grandfather or pregnant mother or a lame child that had to be left behind when the camp had to be quickly deserted. The patrols were not interested in taking captives. It was much too much trouble to transport them back to the fort. Any Navajo they saw was sought, shot on sight. Mothers were sometimes forced to suffocate their hungry or crying babies to keep their families from being discovered and butchered by an army patrol or taken captive by slave raiders. In January of 1864, Abraham Lincoln personally approved the creation of Bosque Redondo. Bosque Redondo was called a reservation, but technically it's a death camp. Over the next few months, 10,000 Navajo and Apache people were rounded up and marched down to Redondo, Bosque Redondo. Several hundred people died of starvation and exposure during this walks. And while on this walks, they were living on land that was um, covered with alkali, and so crops could not be grown. Uh, there was no way to burn fire, burn wood, because there was no, no foliage or no, no um, trees or anything in the area. They had to actually walk for 10 to 12 miles to go and get things to burn, to cook with. They were fed when no food was able to be grown. They were fed the, the rotted, rotting and wasted food that the soldiers weren't able to eat. Um, and during this time, a quarter of the people who were imprisoned at this camp died. In his annual message to Congress in 1863, Abraham Lincoln declared that 1.4 million acres were taken up under the Homestead Law. In July of 1864, he signed the second part of the Pacific Railway Act. This doubled the amount of land given for the Transcontinental Railway, and it provided the completion of the Manifest Destiny and the completion of the railway and the transcontinental um, telegraph lines. In the fall of 1864, Colonel General Shivington came across the Cheyenne and Arapaho. Now in 1851, the Cheyenne and Arapaho were essentially given in a treaty the territory of Colorado as their land. And they were residing on this land. But in, 18, in 1855 or somewhere around there, gold was discovered in the Rocky Mountains. And soon that land was being run over by settlers and excavators. So in 1864, Colonel Shivington comes across a group of Cheyenne and Arapaho people on their treaty land, and he orders them all slaughtered. Within two years after this, the Cheyenne and Arapaho have completely surrendered, and they're removed to Oklahoma. In his annual message to Congress in 1864, Abraham Lincoln reported that 1.5 million acres were entered in upon the Homestead Law, and the great enterprise of connecting the Atlantic with the Pacific states by railway and telegraph lines has been entered upon with a vigor that gives assurance of success. Now, if you look at the original routes of the Transcontinental Railway, there were three routes that will, will, were built first. Are the first five routes, three of them, I want to highlight for you. The first is the central route. This is the main route. It goes from Omaha, Nebraska to the Central Coast. It goes right through the land of Wyoming and Colorado, where the Cheyenne and Arapaho lived. Another one of the first five tracks that were built started in Duluth, Minnesota, and went to the Pacific Northwest, directly through the state of Minnesota. And the southern route went through the territory of New Mexico, which is where the Navajo and the Apache lived. Within two and a half years of signing the Pacific Railway Act, Abraham Lincoln has ethnically cleansed and genocidally removed all the natives from Minnesota, from Colorado, and from New Mexico. Now, I want to talk about the 13th Amendment. We already discussed that it doesn't abolish slavery. But to understand the 13th Amendment, you really have to understand the Lincoln-Douglas debates. So in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Abraham Lincoln and Judge Douglas, they actually agree on something which is white supremacy. They both get cheers and hollers from the crowd whenever they explicitly affirm white supremacy. They both get laughs from the audience when they preposterously um, propose that blacks might somehow be equal. They both agree on white supremacy. There's no doubt about that. They disagree on slavery. 
Judge Douglas believes slavery is necessary to keep white supremacy intact, and Abraham Lincoln believes we can keep white supremacy intact without the institution of slavery. And so the dilemma that he has, well, so, so in this debate, Judge Douglas accuses Lincoln of applying the Declaration of Independence to black people. And Lincoln applies, well, replies, I think the authors of that notable instrument intended to include all men, but they did not mean to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all men were equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. Now, he's not talking about individuals. He's not saying some men are taller and some men are smarter. He's talking about race here. Later, Judge Douglas accuses Lincoln of wanting to make citizens of black people. And Abraham Lincoln replies and says, Judge Douglas has said that he has not been able to get an answer from me to the question whether I'm in favor of Negro citizenship. So as far as I know, the judge has never asked me the question before. He shall have no occasion to ever ask it again. For I tell him very frankly, I am not in favor of Negro citizenship. It's my opinion that the different states have the power to make a Negro a citizen under the Constitution of the United States if they choose. If the state of Illinois had that power, I should be opposed to the exercise of it. That is all I have to say about it. So Abraham Lincoln had a dilemma. He didn't like slavery, not because he cared about black people, but he was, under, he was convinced it was ripping white America apart. And he was afraid that white people are going to destroy each other over the question of slavery. But he had a dilemma. What do you do with black people if you end the, the, the current institution of slavery and you don't want them to become citizens and you don't think they're equal. What do you do with black people? Well, you create a subclass here of citizenship. You hold them under the fear of the removal of their civil rights by a white judge and a white jury and a white law enforcement officers. Mass incarceration was the brainchild of Abraham Lincoln for how do we keep, what do we do with our black people, our people of color, after we end slavery, but we don't want them to ever feel the rights of full citizenship. I think he'd be rather proud of our incarceration rates today. I think he'd be pretty pleased that we have more than twice the number of African Americans under the criminal justice jurisdiction than we had enslaved in 1850. Now, the last thing I want to look at, and I have a slide here, I want to show you. I want to go back to the population growth. So, in 1839, there were 11 million Jews in the world, at the start of the Holocaust. And by 1945, there were 11, or there were 17 million reduced to 11 million. So that's the 35% genocide rate that Hitler had. In the census in 1860, we had 44,000 estimated natives in America. And in 1870, we had an estimated 25,000. This is the years Lincoln was president. He had a 41% genocide rate. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why is he our greatest president? He's not the great emancipator. He unified white people. We credit him with winning the Civil War, but the Civil War was only an internal conflict. This was white people fighting white people, destroying themselves over slavery. They all agreed on white supremacy. They disagreed on did they need slavery or not. The actual war he won was the War of Manifest Destiny. Imagine if he had won the Civil War, but not been able to remove the tribes from Minnesota, Colorado, and New Mexico, and not been able to complete the Transcontinental Railway. 
would have been a failure. He didn't abolish slavery. He protected white supremacy and gave us the tools that we're still using today. What happened at Starbucks in Philadelphia a couple months ago? The system's working. (laughs) The system's working. A white store owner, manager, doesn't want some black people in her store. She calls. She doesn't ask for them to be arrested. She just calls the police. The police who have a black police chief come. They know when they're in a tough situation. They know what they're there to do, but they want to make sure they've been trained in implicit bias. So they call a supervisor to come and make sure everything's done by the books. They politely ask the men to leave. The men say no. Why do they say no? Most people say you just obey the police officer. Why would they say no? Because 60 years ago, they were forbidden from sitting in a store with white people. They are in a possible situation. They cannot comply with the police. They'll be walking back 60 years of history. They have to stay there. And so they get arrested. And the black police chief says, my men did nothing wrong. Why? Because the system works. Abraham Lincoln gave us the tools that we are using today. Why do you think black people have to have a talk with their kids when they start to drive? Why don't white people have that talk with their kids? Because the system works. Perfectly. Remember, who writes the history books? The victors. How would Nazi Germany have treated Hitler? It's a hero. It's no mistake that the Lincoln Memorial is modeled after the goddess Athena and her temple in Athens. that we've carved his face on the most, one of the most sacred mountains of the Dakota people. The problem is not that Abraham Lincoln's Adolf Hitler. That comparison's easy. Lincoln condemns himself. That's easy. The nauseating thing is that we are not dissimilar from Nazi Germany. We just won the war. We're not better. Come on. We just won the war. We wrote the history books. This is the painful history we have to deal with. This is the painful discussion that we have to have. So I want to ask you now, I want to go back to this quote. The United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation on par with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that took place in South Africa, Rwanda, and Canada. I'm calling it Truth and Conciliation, and my goal is 2021. Because we're going to kill ourselves if we don't deal with this. We're falling apart, people. There's a, there's an Aboriginal leader named George Erasmus. He says, where common memory is lacking, where people don't share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build a community, he says, you have to start by creating a common memory. I think this quote gets to the heart of our nation's problems with waste, which is we don't have a common memory. We have a dominant culture that remembers a history of discovery, expansion, opportunity, and exceptionalism. And we have communities of color that have the lived experience of stolen lands, broken treaties, slavery, Jim Crow laws, 
genocide, massacres, internment camps, segregation, separation of families. We have no common memory. And I think we all can agree that on a national level, community pretty much sucks right now. So I want to talk about this dialogue I want to have. I want to spend the, the, the rest of my time here. We have a few more minutes. What time is it? It's 8.30. I want to take about 15 minutes to talk about this. We have to go through this quickly because I want to leave some time for Q&A. We need a national dialogue that I'm calling a Truth and Conciliation Commission. The reason I'm using the word conciliation is because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. And the context of our conciliation primarily is around race. And if you understand the history of race in America, there never was previous racial harmony here. So reconciliation, racial reconciliation is a misnomer. Conciliation is merely the mediation of a dispute. We don't need racial reconciliation. That perpetuates the myth of America. We used to be great, now we're not. We need racial conciliation. We need to just, conciliation is just to, to make things better from a bad situation. So I'm looking for not a truth and, con and reconciliation commission. I'm looking for a truth and conciliation commission. And there's several different groups I want to invite into this dialogue. The first group is the church. My preparation for the church is I want the church to understand that it's complicit in this history. It wrote the doctrine of discovery. It empowered empire to its rates of genocide. It's complicit in this history. And the church has to recognize that and acknowledge that and seek healing from that. I'm calling the church into a space of lament. Lament is a beautiful space that God gives his people in the scriptures. Lament is not fixing something. Lament is not, lament is just allowing yourself to sit in the pain, to sit in the brokenness. I'm writing a book with my, my co-author's name is Sung Chan Ra. We're writing a book on the doctrine of discovery. And about three years ago, Sung Chan published a book called The Prophetic Lament. And in his book, he, he acknowledges, or he clarifies that lament, he says, it's like being at a funeral. You have a dead body in the casket, and it's not going to come back to life. You're at the funeral for one purpose and one purpose alone, which is to say goodbye and to mourn. The United States of America, the church, we have hundreds of thousands, millions of people, hundreds of years of dead bodies in caskets. And we can't bring them back to life. We have to lament them. Now, Sung Chan points out the American church has a very difficult time lamenting. I tell people it's difficult to lament when you believe in your own exceptionalism. And so I'm not calling the church into a song of lament. I'm not calling the church into a, a, a service of lament. We need to go into a season of lament. Because who changes the seasons? God does. The problem with the American church is we don't stay in the lament long enough. We're terrified of it. And so I want us to stay in lament long enough. And when you look at lament in the scriptures, God always shows up when his people lament. He always shows up. He doesn't come quickly, but he always shows up. The problem is we as a church never stay in lament long enough to meet God there. So there's this whole side of God's character that we've never met because we don't stay in lament long enough. And so I am calling the church into a season of lament. The second group I want to talk to is peoples of color. Now, my message to people of color is about trauma. So who here has heard of PTSD, post-traumatic stress, right? It's an individual diagnosis for someone who has experienced a horrifying event. It affects you, it affects you mentally, physically, emotionally. It's this all-encompassing condition that is affecting a person who has experienced a horrifying event. An individual diagnosis. It's not that group of people have PTSD. It's that veteran, that abuse victim, that person is suffering from post-traumatic stress. Now, there's another trauma called historical trauma. 
Historical trauma is how psychologists understand the deep dissatisfaction within a broad community. It was actually developed to understand the deep dissatisfaction in native communities. Now, historical trauma, um, it affects you on all different levels, and it's been proven scientifically, clinically, to be passed down from one generation to the next. So historical trauma doesn't end with the generation that was traumatized. It's passed down generation to generation. So I refer to historical trauma as a multi-generational communal manifestation of PTSD. Does that make sense? So on the individual level, you have post-traumatic stress. On the communal multi-generational level, you have historical trauma. Now, if you want to engage this dialogue on race and gender and class, and you go into a native community and you try to talk about the history and you don't understand our PTS of our boarding school survivors and you don't understand the historical trauma of our community, you're going to say something, you're going to trigger something, and you're going to get responses that are going to derail your entire conversation. If you try to come into some of our, of, our, of our immigrant communities or into our African-American communities and try to talk about this history and you don't understand the historical trauma and the post-traumatic stress of the individuals and the people in this community, you're going to say something, trigger something that's going to derail your entire conversation. Now, fortunately, because we're training, we're understanding, we're looking at historical trauma, we are developing tools to better engage these communities. But what's the community that most often trips up the dialogue on race? It's the white community, right? The problem is, is we think the white community came out of this history unscathed. But there's another trauma that we don't talk much about. It's just being researched recently. That trauma is called perpetration-induced traumatic stress. Now, the, the psychologist who's looking at this, Rachel McNair, wrote a book back in 2002. She identifies perpetration-induced traumatic stress, or PITS, as being like PTSD in every way, shape, or form, except instead of afflicting people that experience or were victims of a horrifying event, PITS afflicts the perpetrators, the people who cause the horrifying events. She actually looked very closely at a very comprehensive study on Vietnam veterans. And she looked closely at this quote by Socrates, who said, the doer of injustice is more miserable than the sufferer. So I hypothesize if PTSD has a multi-generational communal manifestation that we call historical trauma, it makes sense to me that Pitts would also have a multi-generational communal manifestation, which is what I refer to as the trauma that's afflicting white Americans because you cannot build a nation on 500 years of dehumanizing injustice without traumatizing yourself. Now, I'm not trying to convince white Americans they're traumatized. This message for people of color. I wanna treat white Americans as traumatized. The challenge is, well, so the first symptom of trauma is shock and denial. Do I have to say anything else? <laughs> I mean, is, that, is that pretty clear? First thing with trauma is shock and denial. Now, second, trauma patients have what are called triggers. Triggers are a sight, a sound, a smell, something that takes you out of reality and back into the chaos of the moment of when the trauma occurred. So for a PTSD victim from the battlefield, it could be the backfire of a muffler. For an abuse victim, it could be a certain scent or a brush of the skin or a song or some, something else. So a trigger takes you out of reality and back into the chaos of the moment of when the trauma occurred. So if we understand white Americans as another group of traumatized people, it's very easy to see their triggers. So eight years of a black president was a trigger. White America, supremacist white America, did not know what to do with the optic of a black man governing from an office they built specifically for white men to govern from. If you think about it, without President Obama, we never get Donald Trump. We don't. We do not elect someone that explicitly racist and sexist without eight years of a black president. It's a trigger. Any sort of national dialogue on immigration and gun control is a trigger. 
white America cannot have this conversation without screaming at each other and talking crazy to each other. Remember when we had this, this gun control rally in DC just like a month ago, right? Two months ago. Hundreds of thousands of people there asking, begging law enforcement to change the gun laws. Rick Santorum, the next day, was on the Sunday talk shows. And he is condemning the students who called this rally and saying they are not taking responsibility. They are here asking for other people to solve their problems when they should be out learning CPR. <laughs> now, first of all, is CPR going to help a gunshot victim? Right, you got a hole in you. Do you need to pump more blood? Come on. This is crazy talk, right? Why? It's a trigger. No pun intended. White America cannot have immigration reform. You guys know this conversation very, very, very well here. White America cannot talk about immigration reform without screaming crazy at each other. I refer to ISIS as a trigger. Now, why is ISIS a trigger? Well, they're a group of religious zealots ethnically cleansing a land to set up their own pseudo-religious empire. <laughs> Who's that sound like? This is white America, right? If you have a friend who steals cars for a living, what are they afraid of? If you have a friend who's committing adultery, what are they afraid of? Their spouse is cheating on them, right? If you have a nation that's built on ethnic cleansing, stealing land, and genocide, what are they afraid of? Same thing. ISIS is a trigger. White America cannot handle that optic. It's so frickin' familiar to them. Now, the challenge is, is again, most of us as people of color think white America came out of this history unscathed. And we tend to treat white Americans in one of two categories. We either believe white Americans are racist or we believe they're fragile. Now, I don't think either of those are helpful. If white Americans are racist, if you're racist just because of the pigmentation of your skin, that means there's no conversation for white people in the dialogue, and that's not helpful. That means every time they stand up and say something, I have to take it as an affront. I'm being attacked. I have to defend myself and mix it up. That's not helpful. If white Americans are fragile, and every time they're offended or hurt, I have to go and soothe it over, and make them feel better. So it means I have to walk around them on eggshells. That's not helpful either. Now, when you are traumatized, most likely it's your friends and family who know you're traumatized before you are because you're in a state of shock and denial and they can see your reactions are not normal. And so maybe they convince you to go to a counselor. When you get to the counselor, the first thing the counselor is trying to do is understand what is this person's triggers? Because there's a disconnect between your psyche and your reality and they're looking for how can I get in to help understand what's going on in their mind and so they're looking for your triggers so when they find your trigger whether it's a cage of butterflies or the smell of burnt toast or the backfire of a muffler once they find your triggers what do they do they found your trigger you're screaming at your counselor do they scream back at you no they're not afraid of you do they say, oh, I'm sorry I brought that up. I'll never talk about it again. Let's leave and go do something else. No. What do they do? They start asking you about it, right? This is what drives you crazy by your counselor. They find your trigger and then they ask you about it. Right? Because they want to get to the heart of the matter. This is what we need to do with white America. They're triggering all over the place. Rather than being a, feeling attacked and attacking back, let's just calm down and act like the counselor. Rather than trying to soothe it over and make everything better, let's act like the counselor. It's not that we're better, 
But I would dare say more people of color are aware of their trauma than white people are aware of their trauma. And just being aware of the fact that you're traumatized, you're in a much better place than if you're still in the state of shock and denial. And so I'm not trying to convince white people they're traumatized. I'm trying to convince people of color that white Americans are traumatized so that we can begin to treat them more appropriately. So that we can actually have this conversation and bring it to the next level, which is where it needs to go. Now we have to be very clear, white people are not victims of trauma. This is a perpetration induced traumatic stress, but they still experience trauma. And we have to learn to treat that appropriately. Now, the next group of people I want to talk to are native peoples. My message to native peoples is that we are the host people of the land and we have to begin acting like the hosts. I loved what happened at Standing Rock. For the first time in this continent's history, we had tens of thousands of native peoples, hundreds of tribes coming together, standing in solidarity, listening to the wisdom of our elders, committed to peace, committed to prayer, and telling this nation of undocumented European immigrants, you can't drink oil. Water is life. You want to live sustainably. You have to learn from seven generations behind you and think seven generations ahead of you. I love the way our people were beginning to take our role as the host people of the land. My last message, and I'm going to end with this, is to millennials. I'll go through this fairly quickly because I wanted to have some Q&A. My message to millennials is I love them. Millennials are great. Millennials, they are now the, the largest voting bloc in the country. They outnumber boomers. And millennials, they're the first generation of truly multiracial people. It wasn't until the 1960s that biracial marriage even became legal. My parents were like the first ones to run to the courthouse after, not really, but soon after that it became legal, they, my parents got married, late 1960s. So I'm an anomaly for my generation. But millennials, they're like completely enmeshed in this biracial world. Their parents and grandparents went to bed paranoid about who their child was going to marry. They don't even think about it. They are truly one of the most pluralistic generations this nation has ever seen. And I think they have a really, they've learned a lot about what does it mean to live next to people who are different from you. Millennials, if they're a Christian, they can have friendships with Muslims, with Hindus, with atheists, with other people. Their parents and grandparents could never do that. If they had a friendship with a Muslim, that friendship was evangelistic. They were praying for them every night. They were scheming every day. How can I get them to say the prayer and bend the knee? <laughs> it's not a friendship, right? Millennials, not that they don't believe truth. They believe, they believe what they believe. They're not afraid to talk about it, but they're also not trying to drive it down the throats of everyone around them. They've learned to live in a pluralistic society. And I think pluralism is one of the values we need to learn as a nation. I can convince most boomers and Gen Xers that this nation has never been Christian. I can convince most boomers and Gen Xers that our nation isn't Christian now. The hardest thing I have convincing boomers and Gen Xers of is that their job is not to make America Christian. That's what they think. They think their job is to make America Christian. This is what the whole gay marriage thing is about, right? If you think about it, Christians do not have a monopoly on marriage. There are many cultures, many peoples that believe in a monogamous, covenantal relationship between two people. Christians do not have a monopoly on marriage, but what are we trying to do? Legislate a Christian definition of marriage. Why? Because we want to make America Christian. 
Jesus had numerous opportunities to make the empire Christian. He never did it. There's no such thing as a Christian nation. It doesn't exist theologically. You have a secular nation and you have a Christian church. So regardless of what your personal theology or your denomination's theology is on gay marriage, your job as a Christian is not to legislate gay marriage or legislate against gay marriage. That's not your job. And millennials get that. So their parents are literally at the Supreme Court fighting for the right to not bake a cake for someone they theologically disagree with. And Malaya's like, cool, my friends can marry the people they love. Our nation is incredibly colonial. And pluralism is an incredible antidote to colonialism. Even Jesus got this. Right? Remember when the rich young ruler came up to him? Say, so, hey, how do, I, how do I become a Christian? How do I get to heaven? She said, well, do A, B, C, D, and E. He goes, like, cool, I've done them, I'm in. She said, well, you're missing something. Sell everything, come follow me. He goes, like, no, I don't believe that. And he walks away. Now, the amazing thing is that Jesus let the guy walk, right? He let the guy walk. He didn't mock him. Hey, you're an idiot, you're going to hell. Ha <laughs> ha. He didn't grab him and twist his arm. I don't care what you think. You're following me no matter what. No, he let the guy walk. He didn't lower the bar. You don't have to give away everything. Just sell something nice. <laughs> he let the guy walk, right? He had to run into him at the synagogue. He had to see him around town. He had to somehow have a relationship with this guy thereafter. He let the guy believe what he wanted to believe and go his own way. I think the church can thrive in one of two environments. I absolutely believe the church can thrive in a persecuted environment. It can. And I absolutely believe the church can thrive in a pluralistic environment. What will kill the church is when it becomes the imperial power. that we've lost all witness. We've lost everything. And I think millennials are onto something. And I want to affirm them for what they're doing. I want to affirm them. The last thing I want to say, then we'll take some time for some Q&A. In his final State of the Union, President Obama, he was talking about the need for a new politics. And he said, we the people, our constitution begins with these three simple words. Words we come to recognize mean all the people. Now that sounds beautiful, right? The problem is that we've never decided this. We've never decided that we want, as a collective group of people, as a nation, for we the people to mean all the people. The Founding Fathers didn't mean it. Abraham Lincoln didn't mean it. The Civil Rights Movement didn't get us there. President Trump doesn't believe it. As beautiful as it sounds, we've never decided we the people now means all the people. And this is the question we have to decide. This is the question we, we have to stop protesting Starbucks and protesting President Trump and protesting President Obama and protesting this senator and that congressman. We have to stop protesting the people and we have to start engaging and changing the system. The United States of America is not racist and sexist in spite of our foundations. We are racist and sexist because of our foundations. And if we want to be a nation where we the people means all the people, then we have to make some foundational level changes. And we have to get the church out of bed 
with the empire. This is my work. This is my call. This is my hope. And I want to invite each and every one of you to join me. Thank you very much.